climate change doesn't live on an island where I am impacted by it. It's really not and shouldn't be a political issue. Climate One has ensured that indeed many, many different parties have seats at the table. Every mainstream religion has a mandate to care for creation. We all have a moral responsibility to the future. The way parents have a responsibility for their children. We all have children or relatives who are very young. Do we not want their world to be good too? Do we not see clearly that what we are doing is not sustainable? And if you do see that, and you continue to deny it for some political reasons, then this is a travesty. Kids are growing up now and there's absolutely no question on whether climate change is real, whether climate change is happening. And the question now instead is what should we do about it? The future of environmental activism is motivating young people to become civically engaged. Now more than ever, we need to come together as a culture and a society to address this really important issue. I am a supreme optimist. I do believe that we can transform ourselves. I do believe that we have the energy, ability, and courage somewhere inside of all of us to do what has to be done. Thanks for joining us for this live stream conversation with Wanjira Matai on sustainable development and the power of women. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. You can submit your questions today in the live section, in the comment section of the live stream. I'm delighted to welcome Wanjira Matai, Managing Director for Africa and Global Partnerships at the World Resources Institute. Wanjira, welcome to Climate One. Thank you so much, Craig. Delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation today about right. lots of things. And um, Africa is responsible for less than 4% of the planet's greenhouse gas emissions, while the G20 is responsible for about 80% of emissions. Yet people in poor countries are already suffering climate impacts first and worst. How do you feel when you hear that? Does it make you mad? It does. It makes me sad. It makes me mad um, because it is a, a, a great injustice that, just as you've put it, it's, it really is the um, most important question that we must address is that injustice. And how do we do that? And what role can empowering women play in doing that? You know, Greg, one of the things that is, is truly important is to acknowledge that injustice. The first thing is knowing that exactly uh, science is so clear now that, that the, the climate is changing. It's changing because of what we are doing to it. The human impact on climate is now indisputable. And then the fact that actually with that climate change will come absolutely unbearable impacts. And those impacts will hit hardest those who have the least done, have done the least to cause this problem. Now that in itself, if you look at a continent like Africa, where I live in, in Kenya, what that means for daily life is the disruption of farming, the disruption of movement of goods and services, especially when we have too much water or too little water, which is heavy rains or no rains at all. We are largely a, a, a rain-fed agricultural economy. The GDP of, our, of many parts of our world are driven by agriculture, rain-fed agriculture. So just imagine for a second, the impact of not having rains at the right time at the right place. It really does wreak havoc on food security. And that is fundamentally what we absolutely need to survive. We haven't even talked about the damage to livelihoods, businesses that are flooded out, businesses that rely on energy that is coming from hydroelectric powers. When water levels are low, you cannot run this. The entire livelihood and systems that we depend on, our entire life support systems are built on a healthy climate and a healthy environment. And that's at stake. And women are at the heart 
of this transformation. Women drive agriculture on the continent. Women hold the, the, their communities together, their children together. We know from research, actually, Greg, that women spend close to 70% of their income on their families when they have it. And how are uh, the impacts are disproportionately landing on women who often fetch water, often cook over dirty cook stoves. So how are the impacts disproportionately affecting women and what impacts are you already seeing personally? Well, then we have those impacts that are, are affecting society as a whole, impacts like infrastructure destroyed. And so we cannot have a movement of goods and services, which is about trade, which is, of course, about the, the livelihoods of people being able to run their businesses. We have issues of lack of water, which spells havoc in a drought situation, droughts becoming famines and people going hungry. We have millions of people in the East African region at the moment hungry because rains have failed for three, four years in a row. And so we have absolute disasters. And that is women and children most disproportionately affected. We do have an energy crisis. And one of the things that is becoming abundantly clear now is that energy development and climate are inextricably linked. We cannot talk about uh, climate change adaptation the ability to bounce back from the worst of climate if we do not deal with the ability for communities to lift themselves from poverty. Because, Greg, poverty is the greatest underlying driver of vulnerability. And that vulnerability is what causes so much loss and damage when we have the impacts of climate change. And so being able to build a level of prosperity is very much a part of building resilience. And you cannot build resilience and you cannot build prosperity if you do not have energy. So energy becomes a really important part of the climate discussion. And you will have heard so many of us talking about the, the energy transition, the ability for us to ensure that we have energy security. Right. And that transition, we know that uh, the developing countries, if they develop in the fossil intensive way that the industrialized North developed, uh, that explodes uh, carbon emissions. So how can that prosperity you're talking about happen in a new, cleaner way? Is it with leapfrogging technology? It's not by following the playbook of Europe and North America. Well, Greg, that's true. But the, here's, here's the reality that Africa has... Uh, is responsible, as you said in the beginning of the program, for 4% of global emissions. Remember that 3% of those are in South Africa. So overall, Africa, outside South Africa, is responsible for just 1% of global emissions. We also have 600 million people who are cooking on open fires around the world. We have a majority of those here on the continent. We have poverty levels that are unacceptable for 750 billion people living under the poverty line absolutely unacceptable. We have got to make addressing the energy situation also about addressing poverty. And addressing poverty therefore means we have to make available the resources for that clean uh, energy transition. Because we know, unfortunately, Greg, there has been very little solidarity with the vulnerable countries on the renewable energy agenda. Yes, we know that that's the best way to go. Yes, we know that that would be even cheaper, but it takes a significant amount of resources to build the technology and put it in place to deliver renewable energy and sustainable energy for all. The challenge we have today is that of all renewable energy investments globally, only 2% end up in Africa. What are we saying? about what Africa needs, what Africa's development needs are, what Africans' economic development needs are with respect to energy. When we only allow 2% of investments in renewable energy, Africa's agenda cannot wait. And that's why there is a discussion around what alternatives does Africa have? Because the skin in the game that most of us have is that we are faced with poverty levels that are unacceptable. But we also see very little solidarity from the North. We see very little solidarity on, on climate finance. We know that we've been talking about 100 billion for a long time, two decades, and we haven't seen it come. And so how our are our governments and our leaders supposed to address the energy poverty situation? 
renewable energy, yes, but who's going to pay and when? Right. And that comes down to it. We're in an age, particularly in the United States, where uh, taxpayers don't like to invest even in their own infrastructure and their own roads and airports, things that you you think would would serve the country. So it's what's the case to be made for why Americans or Europeans should send their tax dollars to a country, a, a continent that they know little about, where they will probably never travel, and it seems so far away to them. How do you make that case other than, you know, kind of the moral obligation? You know, what's in it for them? Because that, sadly, that case has to be made. Absolutely, Greg, that case has to be made. But no better case was made than with the COVID uh, pandemic. We knew that the COVID pandemic left unaddressed everywhere would be a problem for us everywhere. And that's exactly what has happened. We would not have had the sort of mutations and and variants that we have now in almost uncontrollable ways if we had made it our business, especially as the rich global north who developed this vaccine. And instead of treating it like a vaccine for the people to address this disease once and for all, they hoarded it. We know the stories of the COVAX facility, and it was absolutely scandalous what happened with that vaccine. And now what do we have? We have countries that have almost 90% vaccination rates, and we have others that are barely uh, 10, 20% vaccination. What does that mean for for the global health? It means we will continue to be confronted by variants of this disease in a way that would not have been if we had addressed it heavy on the head for all of us. This is the sort of solidarity that is called for even in climate, that we cannot address the climate crisis only in our little corners because climate change knows no borders. We will continue to face the worst of climate. Yes, those in developing countries will be most disproportionately affected. But remember, they did not cause this problem. We are fighting a battle that was never ours to fight with tools we do not have and finance we do not have. That is a moral question, and it is still a moral question on climate. I believe for many Americans to understand that their responsibility to address their own emissions, decarbonization as an agenda for the global north is undeniable. There is no clean development pathway with fossil fuels in the north. That is, there is no pathway that allows you to do that and get to net zero by 2050. There's a lot of pathways that allow other countries to develop and become a lot more prosperous and able to sustain themselves that allows multiple more options. And we have to give them that alternative, especially when we are not willing to finance the renewable energy transition. Right. And then the, the atmosphere doesn't care where, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse ga- gas emissions occur. It's all the same exactly. to the atmosphere. As many in the global north look to reduce their addiction to fossil fuels, the minerals required to do so inevitably. You know, 70 percent of the world's cobalt comes from Congo. I'm haunted by images from The New York Times of children carrying massive sacks of ore on their backs. And yet I recently spoke to Morgan Brazilian from the Colorado School of Mines while he agreed that his image is deeply disturbing, he suggested if those children didn't have jobs in the mines, they might starve. What's your reaction to that equation? Well, I I think we have to think about it in a different way. Uh, We have to admit that the, 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 the relationship, the, the interrelation between the North and the South with respect to natural resources has been one of exploitation. I don't think we can say that a lot of those minerals or the, the beef industry in, in, the, in the US that is driving the deforestation of the Amazon or the, the, the green technology industry that is driving uh, mining in, in, in the Congo, or even the palm oil plantations that are driving the cosmetic industry in Europe. These are not relationships that have been built on mutual respect and solidarity. And that's where the, the challenge is. I think that there should be opportunities for countries to explore 
and and you know you look at a country like Ghana that and and Cote d'Ivoire that produce 60% of the world's cocoa they should be controlling a significant amount of the cocoa value chain that's just not the case it speaks to the nature of trade that we have today and until those relationships are fairer and that's why we talk about fair trade then we cannot talk about the fact that this is what the poor children of DRC should be doing. We know that those children, we would much rather they're in schools educate, being educated because the country is earning a fair income from their resources. If that was the case, I think it would be very different. This is not a choice for children to be working in the mines. This is definitely not uh, a priority. So can that mineral extraction happen? Can those the terms of that power relationship be be altered? Can those mines be operated in a cleaner way so that people pay, get paid a living wage? You know, does the Congress well, those, have the power to do that? Well, those are the questions that has, have to be answered by those who are involved in trade and trade relations. And that is an important uh, global architectural system that needs to be addressed, right? We need to look at how we trade with each other. There's a, there's a, a real um, shock in, in the system when you look at how far it takes for supplies to come sometimes from one part of the world to the other. You look at a country like South Africa that buys its rice from Asia rather than purchasing its rice from uh, from Senegal, for example, that produces high quality rice, but there are trade barriers and that's why we must continue to work on the trade architecture because that will be part of building prosperity. Africa's prosperity agenda is serious. We have got in this next decade to build the level of prosperity this continent deserves and there's absolutely no reason why they cannot trade more with each other. Our intra-Africa trade is historically low. 15% of trade goes on within African countries. You look at Asia, it's about 60%. Europe, 80%. So we've got to do better with trading with each other and building those trade relationships. And that will continue to, to help build, shorten our supply chains and also build prosperity that is needed. So it sounds like you support deglobalization, which is being talked a lot about in the uh, because of COVID and because of Ukraine disruption to these long supply chains. It sounds like you support more regional trading with neighbors, uh, rice from Senegal to South Africa rather than uh, far away in Asia. So do you support deglobalization and more regional trading and economies? Well, I, I don't know if it's deglobalization. I support building, uh, short, shortening supply chains. Absolutely, building prosperity more regionally. I think we should grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Absolutely, we need to do better with regional trade. That's how we'll build prosperity. We need to do better with value addition. That's how we'll build prosperity. There's a reason the president of Ghana continues to talk about the fact that he will start producing chocolate in Ghana. The sooner the better so that they can build prosperity with the resources that they have. The same should be across the world. And that will be the only way that we can build the sort of prosperity we want to see. According to a recent IPCC report, people in climate vulnerable countries are 15 times more at risk than developed countries. Bangladesh is 15 times more vulnerable than the Netherlands. How much of that is simply geography and how much of that is perhaps trade and some of the things we're talking about that are connected to perhaps colonial legacies? Well, Greg, actually, it is not geography, because that very uh, statistic that you've mentioned about the Netherlands and Bangladesh, the Netherlands per capita is at more risk than Bangladesh. Bangladesh should not have uh, as much damage as, as uh, the Netherlands, because the Netherlands is, is more exposed per capita to sea level rise. But we know that in Bangladesh, Given the same situation, Bangladeshis will be 15 times more, more uh, affected. So it has nothing to do with geography. It has everything to do with prosperity because you build the sort of technologies that you know, we know how brilliant the Netherlands are about protecting themselves from sea level rise, the sort of research technology that goes into protecting themselves. This is not the case for Bangladesh. And so it is a, it is a difference in, in, um, in prosperity as well.
These developing countries are often characterized as climate victims. You know, what do you think of that frame? You, you frame this as very much of a moral responsibility, but how about that frame of, of being victims? Is that I, I, I don't like this frame of victims because I think it sort of it immobilizes people. I think uh, the communities that are that are impacted by climate change are 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 disproportionately impacted and they're doing everything they can. I think the image of victim makes it look like they're sitting there waiting. They're not. People are working very hard to think about ways that they can uh, protect their populations, protect their countries, especially you look at the island states, Marshall Islands and others. They're very busy working on what they can do, but they need the solidarity of the rest of the world because this is not a problem that they created. Absolutely, they need that solidarity. So to shift from a frame of uh, victimization to empowerment and self-determination, right. those countries have some control over that and, and they need resources and solidarity from others. So it's partly Absolutely. within their control. Yeah. Absolutely. Your mother, Wangari Maathai, won the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize for her contribution to sustainable development. She had started the Greenbelt Movement, which empowered more than 4,000 women's groups to protect and restore their local forests, even in the face of death threats. You've continued her work serving on the boards of both the Greenbelt Movement and the Wangari Maathai Foundation. And you've said you're not living in your mother's shadow, you're basking in her light. I'd like you to say more about that. Yes, I really feel like I bask in her light every day. I mean, to have had the privilege of working with my mother for 12 years was one of the highlights, absolute highlights mm -hmm. of my life. You know, many of us, um, our mothers do what they do. And when I was growing up, I just thought my mother, that's what my mother did, just like somebody else's mother did something else. And I, I knew what she did and she went to work every day and did it, but I never thought it extraordinary in any way. And I never thought her extraordinary. She just did her work with diligence and commitment as I had always known. It was only later that I, I started working with her and I would look over her shoulder and, and I, I really started to appreciate just how genius the work of the Greenbelt Movement was and just how genius and connected and thoughtful uh, she had been in creating this incredible women's movement and, and tapping into the brilliance of those women, their knowledge, to be sensitive. A lot of the communication with these communities was in their local language. She was very keen that people understand what you're telling them, that if we speak in English or Kiswahili, not everybody can understand. So let's make sure that all the forms that these women are filling and all the people working with them speak their language. And that was a really wonderful thing that catalyzed this movement. And so I, I always felt that to have had the front row seat in this amazing, amazing theater of her life was a, a privilege of very high honor. So I always felt like I was basking in her light and I still do today. Everything good that happens to me, I always attribute sometimes to the inspiration that she was in my life. So that's nothing to me but light. Mm, what a tremendous gift. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. How did you come to emotional intelligence? You've been out there talking quite a bit about that, maybe not using that term, but it sounds like some of that you got from your mom. How did you come to that emotional intelligence? Well, actually, a dear friend, uh, Mucha, who, who runs uh, an emotional intelligence outfit, heard me talking about the Wangari Maathai Foundation, that we were working to inspire the next generation of leaders to be better uh, uh, stewards of the environment, to, to feel the, their connection to the environment. And she told me, you know what, you really need to connect with Six Seconds, which is a, a, a an emotional intelligence network, I think the largest in the world. And as I started connecting with them, I realized that it was really in many ways uh, a way to coach myself into how I think, into knowing myself better and understanding my triggers, understanding um, how, I, how I present myself, understanding my own emotions and navigating those emotions. And then also being able to be very clear about 
my purpose? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Does this give me joy? And being very conscious and thoughtful about it. I just loved the way Six Seconds was unpacking all of this. And, you know, I went into Six Seconds because of my work. And I got sort of a twofer because <laughs> I went in because of my work. But I ended up myself being immersed because I learned from the brilliant um, leaders at, at Six Seconds, Jane and others, that actually, if you, you know, Jane Morrison told me that you cannot come into this for your work and not work on yourself. You are part of the work that needs to be done. So I started that journey myself, being coached and working with, with um, my own uh, certification process. And it was only after the first few lessons that I realized, oh my goodness, it is really about me. It's about me too, not only about what we are trying to do at the foundation. And I just fell in love with their, their programs. And I feel like in many ways, it's like a bomb, right? You go, I would go there and I just inhale the wonder of how they teach, the beautiful, beauty of the philosophy. And I really love the philosophy, you know, thoughts like, you know, no way is the way. You just, you know, you, you're okay, just try it, you know, one, two, three, pasta, just do it, go for it. And I just loved that philosophy. And it has, it has inspired me sometimes in ways I don't give uh, much thought to, because it's just become part of we, the way I present myself. And, and, and there's also been a sharpening of, of how I think about things and, uh, and, you know, not necessarily being burdened. One of my favorite thoughts, uh, Greg, from, from Six Seconds is the fact that emotions are data. They, they're telling you something. So you don't have to get anxious about it. You just have to pay attention. What is this telling me? Why is this happening? What is going on? What is going on in me that I'm having this sense of anxiety, heightened sense of anxiety? So that was, uh, I just love it. Yeah, Six Seconds is an emotional intelligence network. I interviewed uh, one of the people involved, Josh Friedman, with uh, Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book and Emotional Intelligence. And I remember Josh saying at one point, you know, all change begins within because we're looking uh, outward. In fact, I recently came across the, the quote from Rumi, the Persian poet and theologian, who said, quote, yesterday I was clever, so I tried to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. Mm. And gets to that's really good talking that's really about good. yeah so with regard to climate how do you approach changing the world and also changing yourself with respect to climate disruption and i'll confess that i struggle with this because i know that all change begins within and yet the narrative of individual responsibility is one that the oil companies have propagated because they want to turn responsibility away from them and the suppliers back on individuals. So when I say like I, that, help, you know, how do you sort that one out? If change begins within, how do we not fall into the trap of, oh, it's my carbon responsibility. It's my, fo my footprint's the problem, not the energy suppliers who are blocking progress. Well, I think it's, it's, it begins within because the, the reason energy supply is, is blocking progress is because we are demanding it. We are, the, we are the creators of that demand. We are the ones who create the demand for, for, um, for fossil fuels. I mean, if we shift, so the market shifts, nothing shifts uh, with demand like markets. I mean, when you consider the fact that COVID hit us and we stopped flying instantly, the, you know, that, there you go. It was, th there is nothing more powerful than the demand that we present as individual consumers. And that's why consumerism is such an important part of the climate solution. We have to change how we consume. And the more we learn about it, and it's hard work, it's hard work, of course, to shift. It's hard work for me. I'm a work in progress myself. So just <laughs> trying to make the sort of shifts that we need to make that we are so used and habituated to doing things in a certain way, taking hot baths in a certain way, not even thinking about how this water is heated that we are using, you know, to, to listen to some of the European conversations right now when they are faced with this energy crisis and to think that if you turn your heat a little bit down, just a little bit, you can save this much if we all do it. It's so fundamental, this adjustment that we all have to make. 
you say that the climate conversation is intellectual and it should shift to more of an emotional one. Talk about that, how people talk about climate kind of up in their head with lots of facts and charts and figures and should be more of a from a different heart centered place. Right. You know, and I do too. I mean, I know all the science. I, I read it. I'm charged by it. I feel like I'm motivated by a lot of these facts, but it's, it just, just seems to be, if you look at the very fundamental one, that 80% of the G20 is responsible for global emissions. We are headed like a speed train in the wrong direction. We have eight years, maybe even seven, to arrest catastrophic climate change. Think about that for a minute. We have to do it in the next seven years. It doesn't seem like we're in a hurry when you look out into the horizon and see how we are, we are addressing issues of new oil wells or new drilling, especially in the countries whose budgets just don't allow, their carbon budgets just don't allow for them to go in that direction. So you're left with the question, why is it? Why is it that so many people who know the science, the science is out there, and that's why youth are so important in this movement. They, they actually can't understand why we have absolutely inertia, nothing but inertia in the face of such devastating prognosis about what's going to happen in the next seven years. And, you know, once, once in a while, I like to sort of remind myself as well, because I get, you know, I work on this every day. And then I'm like, think about that for a minute. Like for the last 20 years, when, they, when you look at the predictions that were made about the climate 20 years ago, they have come to pass and worse. They have all come to pass what the IPCC said about today, a few years ago, a couple of decades ago. So why is, and the science has gotten better. The science has gotten tighter. Why are we not moving with more urgency? That's the intellectual um, overcoming the emotional. Because apparently if we were more connected to the reality of that, we would not be joking about it. And, and we would be moving with more haste. Right. Clearly, the way we've been talking about it hasn't has had some success uh, in some of that, uh, you know, uh, really uh, doom and gloom scenario, as you say, has has come to pass. And many things have happened faster than scientists have predicted. And, and other positive things have also happened faster than predicted. You know, Ezra Klein of the New York Times wrote an article recently saying how the drop in solar prices uh, happened a lot faster than even anyone predicted. You know, the, the largest predictions were 6% a year, and it ended up being a lot more than 6% a year. Right. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, what what's happening on the positive side? Because we tend, as climate people, often to look at the dark side, it, you know, the bad things in are, are happening faster, the good things are happening slower. And yet there are good things that are also happening fast. Yeah, I mean, that is true. It's, it's the good things happening fast, there are bad things happening fast, but the good things are not happening fast enough. And that's the difference. I think we need to, unfortunately, we need to move faster. We've caused untold damage. We've caused with the way we've we've developed. And, and I think we have to move fast, but with, with justice to acknowledge that there are people who haven't been responsible for this and who must be lifted out of poverty because you cannot adapt to climate change when you're at a certain level of poverty. When you're on the cliff, you're on the cliff, even if you have all the best dikes. I mean, it is literally uh, an issue of, of prosperity as well. And that's why the development agenda for vulnerable countries is so important. The poorest of the poor cannot be allowed to continue. You can't adapt against that. That's just impossible. And one area where I think that comes to home or hits people in the wealthy countries is um, is migration. You know, we know that that uh, hungry people, where there's collapse of agriculture, um, move to seek that, whether it's in Syria or from Central America or from the Mediterranean and into Europe, and that has rocked the political order. So how about climate migration? You know, do you hear that, you know, kind of saying like, you know, Africa needs to be able to feed itself or else, you know, hungry continents on the move could really rock the political order? Well, even locally, I, I, I don't even like to think that, you know, we, we sometimes assume people are very desperate to go out of their countries. They are not. Many people actually would rather be at home and, sure. and you know, deal with, with, deal with what they have and, and maybe move around and try and, and shift and adjust. And so by the time people are leaving their homes, it's 
the worst of the worst situation. So I, I think that we have to be prepared for even different kind of migration. There's sort of a, a, a very... Um, uh, an assumption that's very unhelpful that migration will always be in one direction. We must always remember that and the, tree, the, the tides can turn and people will be migrating south to Africa because they can't sustain the heat where they are or for whatever reason. We must continue to see each other as part of a common human family. We don't, we, there's this us versus them, them moving here, them coming here. Mm -hmm. No, I think we need mm -hmm. to realize that if we are not well in Africa, you are not well where you are. Right, and COVID should teach us that, as you as you said earlier. Yeah. You know, the annual United Nations Climate Summit this year called COP27 comes in the 30th anniversary of the Rio Summit, which was a real turning point in global awareness and opened this up for, for a lot of people. How would you rate the progress in the decades since Rio? And what faith do you have that the UN process will do what needs to be done? You know, I'll start with that, the UN process. I think the UN process is critical. We, we hear a lot of criticism. We hear a lot of, um, you know, disappointment sometimes even, but it, it's, the, it's the platform we have. It's a platform that many of us, especially in the vulnerable countries, there is no other platform that allows us to, to have a vote on what goes on in global climate politics. And so that's a very important platform. And I'm grateful for the solidarity of the United Nations in keeping that platform alive and making sure that the leadership there is, is sensitive and, and, and open to, to these discussions. But I think we have to move much faster. We really need to, to find a way that makes what started in Rio, yes, we've made some progress, there are some bright spots, but the future is bleaker still. We have more information about what we are facing and we don't have much time to sit and celebrate. Yes, we must be inspired by the road we have traveled, but we certainly have to be aware that a lot more is expected of us. And coming back to kind of emotional intelligence, is it fear that will bring that, that speed? Is it uh, opportunity? What do you think makes people move faster knowing what you know about emotional intelligence and the way people work on that level? Yeah. I think leadership is important. We need good leaders uh, who are aware and conscious. And so the voting public needs to be alert and put the right leaders in place so that we can move with haste. And we are starting to see that. There are bright spots in Australia and other places where we're starting to see the politics. And in Europe, the green politics make a comeback in, in very big ways because people realize this is their life lives at stake. And, and for many of our generation, perhaps we feel like in 30 years, we'll be 80 years old and maybe it doesn't matter. But for those who are young today, their whole lives are ahead of them. So we are wasting their time and that's why they're taking things in their own hands. We cannot be satisfied and sit on our laurels. Of course, we've made some progress. There are several bright spots and that's why we continue to march. Right. And COVID has brought a lot of uncertainty and disruptions of, of norms in daily life. And climate brings a lot of disruption. And we're seeing that that kind of um, disruption and uncertainty brings um, cranky voters. And sometimes yeah. cranky voters are willing to vote in rather authoritarian uh, leaders in Brazil and Hungary, United States. So are you at all concerned that climate volatility can lead to authoritarianism, which is, you know, there's plenty of examples of that on the continent of Africa. But fortunately, well, well I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think that there, there's plenty of that everywhere, perhaps, uh, no different in Africa than el elsewhere. But I would that, say there are well, a lot well. more bright spots uh, in, in than, than not. We are seeing a lot more uh, young people coming into their voting age and making a very big statements with their votes and, and informing themselves much more. I am I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic about the fact that we will, we will make a difference because we have no choice. I really think if we lose hope, it just means that we have given up and we cannot give up because if we give up, what's left really? Right, and to be fair, yeah, I shouldn't say that there's more authoritarian regimes in Africa. There's certainly plenty of generals in Latin America and elsewhere that have uh, taken that path. And Europe and the US <laughs> everywhere. <Yeah. laughs> 
Yeah, not just the South and North also. Yeah. Um, Looking ahead to COP27, what's being done to put loss and damage at the center of the agenda? And you might explain what loss and damage is and why it's so important. Yeah, you know, we've talked about the fact that the injustice of climate change is that a lot of people who had nothing to do with this problem are facing untold suffering. And sometimes that suffering is so severe, it's difficult to, to bounce back from it. So the, the, the climate, the Paris Agreement coded in it this concept of loss and damage, loss being uh, the loss of lives and property, but damage being some of the irreversible uh, impacts of climate change. So you could have a situation in Bangladesh, this was very clear, uh, common in Kenya, in many parts of the world. Even now we, we are seeing this in the North where there's a severe climate uh, event and uh, After the event is over, there's some recovery, but there's also some irreparable damage. And that that is where the the loss and damage comes in. And the Paris Agreement had in it that we need to avert, address, we need to minimize, avert, and address loss and damage. We've done a decent job of minimizing and averting with all of the early warning systems and everything that we put in place. What we haven't done well with is addressing loss and damage. And this is what the COP27 uh, Glasgow work program on loss and damage is about. It's like getting loss and damage finally squarely on the map, financing the Santiago network, which is the, the, the agreement that was, a, that was created, the Warsaw program that was created to make the mechanism that to activate the the loss and damage facility. My hope is that COP27 will see that facility come to life. We'll see real financial flows into that facility or into facilities for loss and damage. And so it's a very politically charged discussion because a lot of people say that it is about reparations. It may be about reparations in a court of law, but it's about solidarity in a multilateral process. When you look at what's going on, COP26 is about solidarity. And that's where we cannot ignore the fact that even the Paris Agreement coded it. We have to avert, we have to minimize, but we also have to address. We can't ignore addressing loss and damage. That does sound optimistic, particularly given the Global North's um, poor record at delivering on past promises made in Paris by Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, uh, do not have great records of delivering on past promises. And what I hear you thinking that that's going to change in um, COP27, that, that that I hope so. I hope so. I think we saw a shift in in COP26 with loss and damage on the agenda. Yes, we can't celebrate. It was minimal, but it was a bright spot. And so now we push on with the next level of that agenda. And how important is it, particularly with respect to loss and damage, that this year's summit is being hosted on the African continent? It's in Egypt. You know, how much does the host matter? The host matters. The, the host sets the agenda. And I know that the, the agenda will be uh, focusing on issues that are relevant to vulnerable countries and especially those in Africa. But let's not forget that if just because it's being held in Africa, does it make it an African COP? I keep being reminded by young people that what will make it an African COP is that it addresses in more serious ways issues that matter for Africa and not just that it's held in Africa. And we uh, recall, you know, Greta Thunberg saying, you know, no more blah, blah, blah about these international conferences. Uh, you know, I think we recognize the importance of these dialogue, diplomacy and creating consensus, et cetera. But you know, talk about the youth who think that this is a, you know, all these adults talking, you know, communiques, et cetera. It's blah, blah, blah. Do you have some sympathy for that perspective? I do. I do. Sometimes <laughs> I think it is blah, blah, blah. And you, and we <laughs> we really have to show what that, that's amounting to. And that's where they get frustrated is, yes, we talk and then what? And so the action that follows is, is, not, is not there. And that's why this has got to be an, about implementation, about activating real action so that we see movement. Um, for vulnerable countries. We see movement for finance. We see movement for financing of of renewables. We can't talk about renewables have got to be the priority for Africa when in fact we don't fund renewables, but for 2% of all renewable energy investments. We've got to shift that. Let's talk about corporations and markets because we've been talking a lot about policy, international 
diplomacy. There's a lot of focus in the United States and elsewhere on moving markets, moving corporations, at the, both at the individual corporate level, level of uh, environmental, social, and governance, having them kind of practice a cleaner form of capitalism. How much weight do you put in that, trying to kind of tinker with capitalism uh, around the edges of markets or inside an individual company to try to be a little more virtuous voluntarily? That's a little bit beyond my my pay grade. I, I, I you know, my capitalism has never been a subject I, I know uh, significant amounts about. I mean, what, what I do know is we have to shift the way we consume. We have to change the way we consume and understand that actually uh, our health depends on how we consume. We've got to reduce waste. We've got to produce how uh, Consume our consumables in more uh, circular ways so that the waste we have is not so much. We've got to protect nature so that we are not consuming and destroying uh, and driving in an insatiable as if this planet has uh, ins uh, insurmountable amounts of resources for our use, that we've got to be very aware of how we produce, how we reduce um, waste, how we, how we uh, protect the natural resources, and certainly how we produce our food. And so how do you go about that in, in your in your life? You know, is you do you l limit your you work in Africa for a US based organization? How, how do you um, practice that yourself? Well, I certainly try and the waste, the waste element to me is is a very personal thing. We um, just the idea that food goes to waste uh, drives me crazy. So I, I can definitely say, you know, the secularity of our food systems at home is something I'm really proud of. The the, the ability to compost in, in an urban area like Nairobi and bring that compost into our gardens to the ability to to cook what is local and eat what is local is, is really uh, wonderful. And we are fortunate to have such bounty in the tropics of fruits and vegetables and, and to ensure that our diets are just littered with what is local. I love that. Just being able to produce and you know eat what what is 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 close by. Um, so those are some of the things. I mean, we don't do much um, driving around as a family. We we are, we are here. We live close to where the children go to school, and so we try and manage. But it's by far still a lot of. Uh, consciousness that's required in even how we are able to to live. And then I, I, I would say that my own activism is about making things more inclusive and, and fighting for inclusion wherever I can, for more non-motorized transit and for, for more ability to walk around and bike around our cities so that our cities are more livable and not we're building for people and not for cars. So those are some of the areas, I think, in my personal and professional life. And I know you're also involved with clean cook stoves, which are, you mentioned earlier, are very important. And it kind of boggles me that, you know, those have been around for a long time. There are lots of people who have, have worked on that. It seems like such a simple thing. And I know there's obstacles for financing and supply chain, but why? There's been some progress on clean cook stoves. It seems like such a, a simple thing. Why hasn't there been more progress? On, I know. Right? I know you're so right. You know, one time, Greg, a very dear friend, she's late now. She was a dear friend of my mother's and continued to be a good friend of mine. She was 90 years old when I went to tell her that I was working on cook stoves. And she said, you know, Andrea, 60 years ago, I was working on cook stoves. And it was just felt like to your point, like, why haven't we cracked this one? There's, there's a lack, I think, a lack of understanding. We're understanding much more the, the, the enormity of the problem. You know, seeing is believing. To start to see the fact that so many people, 80% of Kenyans still cook on open fires. Imagine that. That is a huge number of people. And that's why the energy agenda has to be about access. We have SDG 7, sustainable energy for all, that is reliable, that is affordable, that is modern, 
that is accessible for all. This has got to be a rallying cry. And that's what the, uh, the clean cooking agenda is about, is acknowledging just the enormity of this problem that doesn't get seen, yet it's pervasive. We cook two and three times every day, and yet we don't necessarily see this as as big a problem as it is. But I think it's becoming, a lot, as the science even around the impacts on health, it comes the impacts on uh, the impact of indoor air pollution on outdoor air pollution is significant. And so all of those things together beginning to drive a real push on prioritizing clean cooking. Yeah, that's happening. Certainly in the United States, there is an awareness of indoor air quality from methane gas stoves. People now have uh, these air monitors because they're measuring uh, pollution from wildfires. And they also notice when they turn their stove on, the the pollution goes way up indoors. And that's an awareness. How much of that awareness, that resistance, do you think is because women do much of the cooking and the men don't care or notice? I think more that they don't notice, you know, I was in India once and had one of the most profound statements I've ever heard. It's this man after he heard about the impacts of cooking and India was at the time actually beginning that subsidized LPG program for for people to, to, to have universal access to LPG gas for cooking. And this man said that after the, the workshop, he said, I never realized I was sending my wife to the kitchen to die. It was so profound that it, it you know, you eat the meals, but you don't realize the impact. I think it's, a, it's, it's always been one of those slow things. Women do the cooking, women and children are often in the kitchen, and the impacts are more disproportionate on them. So as we wrap up here at the end, you know, where do you go to? How do you maintain your own personal resilience and upbeat outlooks? You know, some of it clearly from your connection with your mother, it sounds like, uh, you know, you uh, et cetera. But w- what's your source of renewal and resilience when you're thinking about climate and this injustice and equity uh, every day? You know, I have to say I'm so lucky to do the work that I do. I love my job and I love the the work that the World Resources Institute does at the intersection of just about every issue I care about. You have food, forests, water, energy, cities, and how we move around cities. So sometimes I feel like at work, I'm working on my passion. I'm working on my purpose. And I'm just so grateful that work gives me the energy that it does. I don't feel drained by work. I feel energized by work. And in fact, I feel like I need to, I need to, um, to take to stop sometimes to do <laughs> to 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 do other things and i must say my family i have two wonderful daughters my husband and i do and and just spending time with them and and just being on a on a you know no just chilling out as my youngest one likes to say is is really just really um energizing and and wonderful it 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 just reminds you that this is what it's about Mm, thank you very much for sharing that. Wanjira Matai is Managing Director for Africa and Global Partnerships at the World Resources Institute. It's been a pleasure and an honor, Wanjira. Thank you so much for coming on Climate One. Oh, Greg, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure.